Luigi, how's it going? Have you been out to restaurants yet? No, you know, I'm a chicken. I try to stay away as much as I can. But restaurants in Chicago are reopening. Speaking of, what's happening to our bet? Oh, right. I think it was a particular restaurant in Brooklyn that you like. The way I remember is we could have dinner last weekend at that restaurant. If we could, I win. Otherwise, you win. So I, I did contact that restaurant. They said that they are currently figuring out their plans. They don't have space for outdoor seating. And so when I called them, they said they're trying to figure out how they're going to reopen, but they haven't been accepting diners yet. Okay, so I guess you won. But you won, not yeah. by much. Not by much. <laughs> for once. <laughs> and um, the economy is slowly restarting. Uh, but not all businesses are restarting. In particular, there are a lot of small businesses and restaurants come that are struggling from a financial point of view. So one of the popular numbers that's been thrown around in terms of how many businesses are already closed is 100,000. That doesn't even count the ones that will close in the future. Today, we're going to talk about Kate's favorite topic, bankruptcy. When Yay. businesses cannot uh, keep going the way they... One possibility is to close. The other possibility is to actually go through bankruptcies. From Georgetown University, this is Kate Waldock. And from the University of Chicago, this is Luigi Zangales. You're listening to Capital Isn't, a podcast about what's working in capitalism today. And most importantly, what isn't. So most people perceive bankruptcy as death. This isn't necessarily true. When a large company files for bankruptcy, it usually files for Chapter 11, only about 13% end up being liquidated. Of that 13%, right, the ones that are liquidated, a quarter of them already knew that they had no chance of survival. They were like, yeah, we're going to liquidate, we're not even going to try and reorganize. And so the rest of these companies are either reorganized, they get to continue as they were before, or they're acquired by other firms and operated under the management of those other firms. So Kate loves uh, the topic so much that uh, she ends up loving bankruptcy. It makes it sound like this is a great thing. I have a, a more like necessary evil uh, kind of uh, view of bankruptcy. It reminds me of a famous uh, sentence that late political economist Alan Meltzer used to use, which is uh, capitalism without bankruptcy is like religion without sin. It doesn't work. Actually, uh, to be fair, seen very often is fun, uh, <laughs> and <laughs> bankruptcy is not as much fun. But is bankruptcy does play an essential role in a capitalist economy to maintain the process of creative destruction. Right, and it's also a necessary role if we want to have credit. Right? We need for businesses to be able to borrow money so that they can start up and they can invest and they can hire employees. And businesses wouldn't be able to borrow any money if the lenders didn't know what would happen if they weren't paid back, right? There has to be some sort of system to work out what happens when a business defaults. Now, you might think that the natural kind of remedy if a business defaults on the money that it owes is for the creditor to be able to come in and take everything, right? They take the assets of the business and then they sell them off and they try to get some financial recovery that way. But what's different about the system in the United States is that we actually allow businesses to survive, at least for a little while, because we believe that assets are worth more when they're together, right? When they're kept as a whole, uh, at least in certain circumstances. And so we give businesses the opportunity to try and maximize the value of those assets as a whole before they're liquidated. In fact, the role of bankruptcy is exactly the one of filter, trying to figure it out whether a firm is worth more alive than dead, if it's worth more than alive, how to allocate the losses that exist in a way that is both fair to who invested the money, but also makes the continuation of the business possible. The fundamental point is that bankruptcy is a sorting mechanism to figure out which firms should be kept alive and which, which firms shouldn't be kept alive. Now, that seems kind of like a good thing to me. Right, because at least there's some chance of survival. But still, most businesses, even individuals, think of bankruptcy as this terrible state that they want to avoid. It's a bit like a hospital, and unless you go to a hospital for a delivery of a baby, which is a happy news, generally, when you go to a hospital, it's not good news. And you don't see as a hospital as a happy place. And, uh, but hospitals are very necessary to help people recover, or even to, unfortunately, help them in the process of dying. Yeah, this is absolutely true. Bankruptcy has a bad reputation, right? Most businesses, even individuals, think of bankruptcy as this terrible state that they want to avoid. And 
I think that there's several reasons for that, right? Number one is that it's a sign of failure. It's a sign that somebody made some sort of wrong decision along the way, and you never want to be branded with that. Another reason people don't like it is because in other countries, it's often a lot less friendly than it is in the United States, right? So in some countries, if you don't pay a debt, then your business is automatically liquidated or handed over to a trustee who will liquidate it. And then finally, you know, of course, there is the possibility that a firm will end up liquidated even if it's good. It's impossible for a court to be right 100% of the time. So invariably, there will be some mistakes made. And there can be two kinds of inefficiencies. You can either kill too many businesses that are worth more alive than that, or you can let a lot of uh, businesses that should die survive. And, and generally, non-economists wonder and say, what is the problem? And the answer is, you are wasting a lot of resources. Some of the money that is invested in this business will be burned, and that is reducing the size of the pie to, for everybody. So I think it's important to avoid both these two extremes. And this is very difficult always, but it's particularly difficult today because it's very easy for every business to say, I am bankrupt not because I'm a bad business, but because of bad luck. There are a lot of cases where the COVID is just the last straw that break uh, the camel's back. It's a pretty big straw. It's a, pretty, it's a huge straw, but I was reading the, right. the, the other day on the New York Times, think about bullfighting in Spain. Okay, uh, now Spanish people are asking money to support the Torreador and the entire uh, ecosystem of bullfighting because, of course, they could not perform and they're bankrupt. A lot of people say, wait a minute, bullfighting was on a way out anyway because there is so much resistance against the cruelty for, against the bull, blah, 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 that this is a dying activity anyway. Why do you want to subsidize a dying activity? So some people see this as COVID is just an accelerator of a trend that was taking place. Some others say, oh, this is a terrible uh, straw that hit me for no good reason. And of course, your view are very much influenced on what side of the fence are you on these issues. So in the corporate context, there's really two chapters of the bankruptcy code that matter, right? There's chapter seven where the firm already knows that it's going to shut down and liquidate and sell off all its parts. And there's Chapter 11, where companies at least have a chance of survival. But my impression is that Chapter 11 doesn't really work very well for small firms. Is that true? Yeah, this is absolutely true. In fact, you know, over a decade ago, the National Bankruptcy Conference put together a task force to look at this problem. They were trying to figure out why is it the case that so many small businesses, even though they file for Chapter 11, most of those cases either end up getting dismissed and the company just disappears, or it ends up being switched into liquidation. And so some of the reasons they came up with were that it was too complicated. So a company needs to hire lawyers and they have to kind of understand the complicated process. And small businesses just weren't really equipped to do this. Another reason is that secured creditors typically have too much influence over the process. Let's say your bank, they could just be really annoying and basically force the company into liquidation by exerting too much control over the whole process. The costs are just really high, right? The administrative costs of like paying the court fees and paying trustee fees. These are just too high proportionally for small businesses. And, you know, there's just a lot of procedural obstacles that are in place that prevent small businesses from taking advantage of Chapter 11, including the absolute priority rule. You know, there's an ordering of who gets paid first in bankruptcy and the equity holders, the people who own the business, aren't supposed to get anything until all of the creditors are paid. Now, usually for a small business, that's not possible, which means that historically small businesses have just been forced straight into liquidation. But my understanding is as a result of that uh, committee, etc., a new law was passed that by a lucky strike became law in February of this year. Kate, can you explain to me how this law is changing the game? So this is called the Small Business Reorganization Act. And you're absolutely right that it came into effect on February 19th of this year, which I think was just a couple days before the first known U.S. coronavirus death. Uh, and so this just happened to coincide directly with the timing of the onset of coronavirus. Typically in Chapter 11, there's a plan of reorganization. 
right? Some plan that amends the debt or maybe writes down some of the debt so that the business can survive. Now, in this new act for small businesses, only the managers of the small business can come up with this plan. They had to do it within 90 days to streamline the whole process. There's a case trustee who's appointed to help the small business out throughout the process of coming up with this plan. And then importantly, in order for the plan to be confirmed, the business doesn't need votes from classes of creditors that are impaired, right? They're not going to get paid 100% of what they're owed. That would typically be required in a regular Chapter 11 case. So the solicitation of votes isn't necessarily needed, and the plan can be confirmed by the judge as long as it's considered fair and equitable, even if it violates the absolute priority rule. Right? So even if the original small business owner can continue to own the business afterwards and some creditors aren't paid back in full, this is okay. And so this kind of technically violates the fundamental rule that has existed in bankruptcy, which is that you know the equity holders can't get anything if the creditors aren't paid back. And for the first time, we're kind of waiving that requirement. Okay, let, let me get it this straight. Suppose I run uh, Luigi's Pizza and I don't have a lot of clients and so I cannot pay my debt as they become due. I can file for this new kind of reorganization and for 90 days, I can basically decide on my own what is the plan for restructuring without paying any of the existing debt. So you are the debt holder. You cannot come and take away my oven, even if it was a secure loan, because that will disrupt my ability to produce pizza. And so I think that I have an automatic stay for 90 days. And for 90 days, I'm the only one that come up with a proposal. I can come up with a proposal without a vote of the creditor. So I can come up with a proposal and say, you know, Kate, I'm sorry. Out of your $100 uh, of, of the loan, you're going to see only $2. And tough luck. Let's move on. Okay, so there's a couple modifications I would make to what you just described, the Luigi's Pizza reorganization. Number one is that you're not doing this by yourself, right? There's a case trustee who's an expert in this, who's kind of looking through your books, looking at how much you've made in the past, trying to get a sense of whether you're actually a viable business. Number two, all right, here's where it gets a little bit complicated, but there's a distinction between a secured creditor who has collateral, right? They like technically have a right to seize this pizza oven, which is a physical asset, and unsecured creditors, let's say like your credit card company. Now, the secured creditors still have to be paid in full over the course of the plan. Let's say you come up with a five-year plan for after you emerge. That five-year plan still needs to involve paying back those secured creditors who have the right to the pizza oven. Okay, so so just to make sure, if in my plan I propose something that say I pay you less than 100 cents on the dollar, the plan is not viable. For the secured creditors. For the secured, yeah, yeah you are a secured creditor, you're on my own. I'm a, okay, I'm a secured creditor, <laughs> I'm the bank. You're very secure, yeah. Yeah, but he, what's interesting and different is the unsecured creditor. So let's say you had spent $10,000 on pizza dough using your Discover card. Okay, and you don't want to pay that $10,000 back. In fact, over the course of the next five years, you think that you can only pay $1,000 back. So they're taking like a 90% haircut, basically, on what they've lent you. What's new about this act is that you can still run the business, right? You can still control the firm and technically be the owner of the firm, even though Discover Card is only getting paid back 10 cents on the dollar. Sorry, but as an Italian, not only I know how to make pizza, I also know how to... <laughs> Uh, sort of uh, play <laughs> tricks. So what prevents me from claiming disaster, not paying back you at all? Well, I think the check on abuse is the monitoring that's built into this new act, right? So this case trustee is really supposed to work very closely with the debtor. They're supposed to understand how much cash they have saved up. They're supposed to understand any personal guarantees that might've been made by like you, Luigi, the owner of this business. They're supposed to understand how much money the company's taking in. And so they have a good picture of not only like what debts are owed and what cash has been accumulated, but what things might look like going forward. And they're supposed to come up with a plan. They're supposed to help you come up with a plan in a way that's fair to all of those creditors. But so this, this guy is appointed by the court. Yes. In fact, you know, assuming that you can't pay back some of your unsecured creditors, the only thing that you're supposed to be able to take 
for yourself as the owner of the business over the course of the plan is really like the bare necessities to survive. So basically this plan is going to garnish your wages. They're going to garnish as much as they possibly can, assuming you can still like survive and, you know, pay for education for your kids and stuff. But anything beyond that goes to all of the creditors. Sorry if I'm so Italian in this, but what prevents me from uh, writing a nice check to the trustee to make sure that he does what I want and not what the creditors want? I think that's a great question, Luigi. I'm not sure that those safeguards are in place. I think that this sort of corruption is less uh, endemic in the United States, but it still remains to be seen whether this will be a problem. So this is a a fantastic topic for you to study in the future. (laughs) (laughs) So as Kate said, it was a lucky coincidence that this procedure just got passed before COVID. And so it was relatively easy for Congress, under the CARES Act that was approved at the end of March, they increased the the, the threshold to file for this kind of bankruptcy to seven and a half million in debt. And while it is an untested procedure, better to have this available than not to have it in a moment where a lot of uh, businesses have to go through this filter. Because one point that most people don't fully appreciate is bankruptcy is, as you teach me, Kate, is a federal thing in the United States. And there are only 350 bankruptcy judges. So you cannot rely too heavily on the judges because if you have hundred thousands, if not millions of businesses filing for bankruptcy and you have 350 people doing it, then clearly this is a clog in the system. My understanding, and tell me if I'm wrong, Kate, but my understanding is we did not see immediately a jump in bankruptcy. Mm. We don't know exactly why that's the case. It could be because simply bankruptcy courts were closed, so you couldn't file, or because actually the CARES Act did provide some relief, or because people waited to see whether the conditions will improve. But now we slowly are seeing a, a large number of, of companies going through bankruptcy. And, uh, and then the question is, what is this gonna do to, to the economy in general? And actually, one point that I should know, but I'm sure you know, is what is the treatment of of workers in bankruptcy? So if Ramsey is an employee of my Luigi's Pizza and I go bankrupt and I owe him a month of uh, wage, what's happening? He's an unsecured creditor in the plan. Yeah, so where he is in the unsecured spectrum depends on how old the wages, the past due wages are, if they were relatively recent within the past couple of months, then he's like at the top of the unsecured priority spectrum. But if they were really old, let's say from like six months ago, then he'll be at the bottom. And then in terms of his wages going forward, most small business or most businesses, in fact, submit these motions to the court that say, you know, we have to continue paying our employees. We have to continue paying our expenses in order to keep operating. And so once the bankruptcy starts, if the judge gives permission to continue operating as normal, then his wages will continue to be paid. Yeah. So, so if I delay filing for bankruptcy, if Luigi's Pizza delays filing for bankruptcy, the employees are, not, are, are worse off. Yeah. So if an employee is not paid and then the company waits several months to file for bankruptcy, then yes, that could push them into a lower priority in the claim structure of bankruptcy. It's complicated because A, the CARES Act tried to take care of workers, right? Like the name of the funding that was set aside for small businesses was the Paycheck Protection Program. It wasn't just like money for you to continue operating because what Congress cares most about is employees and workers. So a fraction of that money is supposed to be dedicated to making sure your workers are taken care of. And so I'm doubtful that there's a whole lot of past due wage claims because of the emphasis that's attached to the financing from the CARES Act on paying your employees. The other thing is that there are also inefficiencies that still exist in the bankruptcy code for small businesses. I mean, even though it was lucky that the timing kicked in right before coronavirus, the Small Business Reorganization Act was not written with coronavirus in mind. And so in terms of like, accumulated like leases and um, you know, treatment of that rent in bankruptcy. There, there's a lot that might still push companies into liquidation. And so I'm not sure the right answer is that we should encourage small businesses to file. I want to avoid on this episode 
like giving recommendations to workers because because I, I it depends highly on like what sort of position you're in. And for many workers, it might be the case that it's better for them to be unemployed um, so that they can collect unemployment benefits while they still last and for businesses to stay out of bankruptcy as long as possible because landlords will be very aggressive in bankruptcy and they can use their like leverage to to basically make sure that they're paid first. So I think actually it's like better for small businesses to stay out of bankruptcy for the time being. It's really the landlords that are the problem. Okay, no, I, I'm very curious about that because I thought actually the opposite, that the landlord was screwed in bankruptcy, but you're saying no, that the, the landlord uh, has a lot of power. Is that true? They can be screwed in bankruptcy if you have like a large company with, let's say, a thousand retail storefronts. And so in that case, let's pretend half of those storefronts are not profitable and the other half are. So in that sort of situation, the large bankrupt company would have the ability to reject all of the unprofitable leases. Uh, companies have a lot of power to do that in bankruptcy. And in that sort of situation, lands, landlords might end up getting like screwed in the sense that they don't get paid as much as they were expecting under the terms of their lease. However, in the case of a small business, you know, a lot of these small businesses only have one retail space. And so if they want to continue operating, presumably it's pretty important for them to stay in that one space. Now, for companies that want to assume their leases, which is to say that they want to continue like operating in the same physical retail space, they're supposed to pay back any unpaid rent and then also continue paying rent during the bankruptcy, subject to like a grace period of two months. Um, but the point is that a lot of small businesses won't be able to do that. So you're supposed to pay the back rent based on, uh, on what? Because they're not secure creditors. Yeah, this is a tricky part of the bankruptcy code. You're right in the sense that landlords aren't considered creditors in the bankruptcy, but they do have a contract with a bankrupt company and contractual obligations are treated a little differently than debt obligations in bankruptcy, but that doesn't mean that they have no rights. So if a company wants to continue their lease contract, which is to say that they want to stay in the same space, they have to cure defaults under that lease, which is basically to say that they have to pay back their back rent. Uh, not only that, but they're supposed to do it promptly. This used to make sense in normal times, right? Because if you want to use somebody's property going forward, then it makes sense that you should pay them back for having used that property in the past. Uh, but times are a little bit different now because of coronavirus, and it's not really clear what counts as using this property or what the definition of like a prompt payment is. Some judges are revising these interpretations on their own, uh, but at least according to the historical standards, that back rent is supposed to be paid if you want to continue using that space. But so if I decided to downsize my Luigi's Pizza because uh, is, um, I don't have a lot of people coming in and I only do sort of home delivery, uh, so I, I don't want to stay in the same place. So I can go through bankruptcy, get rid of my lease, not cure the existing lease, and get a lease in a smaller place. That's true. And... You raise a good point, which is that I think what's going to what the bankruptcy code encourages now is for people to switch for small businesses to basically be like, oh, you know, Luigi's Pizza's over there and Kate's Pizza's over here. It's actually beneficial for us, us to just switch spaces, which is not efficient from like a societal perspective. It's more efficient for companies to just stay where they are. And so this treatment of leases, I think, is something that needs to change given the current environment. But this is one of the most important issues, in my view, because besides workers, the biggest cost for a lot of small businesses are the leases they, they pay. Clearly, every miss two or three months of, of revenues, even if they go back to a previous equilibrium, they find themselves incapable of paying all the past leases. And so it could be that uh, the landlord voluntarily renounced to some of that, uh, that would be nice. But in practice, it would be, I think, impossible for most small businesses that really live on the threshold of financial difficulties any time of the day to have the liquidity to pay back three or four months of leases without the revenues. And, and remember, the Payroll Protection Act was not really giving them money to do that. And so either we find a way to have a general kind of uh, partial forgiveness or a lot of businesses would play the game of swapping leases and going through bankruptcy. 
Yeah, I totally agree. According to Payscale, the average small business owner pays the, him or herself about $70,000 a year. So the way that small bi business bankruptcy now is supposed to work is that you reduce that 70000 to an amount that's considered, like, you know, the bare necessity to survive. I don't know how much that's going to end up being, right? It's kind of up to the case trustees and the judges to determine that. But let's say it's, like, $40,000 a year, $50,000 a year, which I think, like, already is quite low. Then that just means that there's there's not a whole lot left over to then go to reimburse all of, like, the, you know, the unpaid debts and, like, the unpaid credit cards and the unpaid leases, for three to six months, who knows? I mean, I just don't think that like that extra amount for a lot of small businesses is going to be enough to pay back all of their old leases. And so you're absolutely right. I think that the real reform that needs to take place on top of the Small Business Reorganization Act is a treatment of leases during the coronavirus pandemic to say there are modifications that could be made uh, to those contracts that allow small businesses to waive some of their lease requirements during the period of like shutdown or the stay at home orders. And this is particularly true for large commercial landowner. They got as a benefit, basically zero interest rates, right? The, the Fed policy was such that the, the cost of capital went down tremendously. And many of those are leverage 75%, 80%. So most of the cost of capital is given by the borrowing cost, and this borrowing cost is approaching zero. So they get a huge benefit on the one side. I think be reasonable that they make some concession on the revenue side. I think the difficult component of what you're saying here is how much of their cost of capital is really going down, right? Are commercial landowners borrowing a lot more? according to like the, the Main Street facilities, are they having their loans be purchased? And if so, I mean, does that really like help their cost of capital if they're not able to tap credit markets now? Or is it the case that there's kind of something going on in the background, which is that the Fed has advised the banks to allow for loan modifications and forbearance, in which case those commercial real estate owners don't actually have to like pay any debts right now. But my, my impression is that there is still a pretty active uh, debt market and many companies have refinanced their debt at much lower rates. And remember, part of the CARES Act is uh, what I call the Mnuchin uh, hedge fund, where the Fed can leverage the $450 billion that the Treasury gives to it into loans for up to $4 trillion. So the Fed has plenty of ability to finance businesses. And the question is, should they make as a condition of good financing the fact that they might forgive or partially forgive some of the leases? It's an interesting idea that if the Fed helps out commercial landlords by providing them like subsidized credit, then they can insert as like one of the conditions for that borrowing that those commercial landlords should then pass on some of that subsidy to their like small business tenants in the form of some sort of lease forgiveness or, or rent forbearance. You know, as of right now, I think, though I might be wrong, that commercial landlords don't actually have access to that Mnuchin hedge fund facility, which I think, you know, I think you're referring to the Main Street lending program. Um, it's kind of up in the air as to whether the real estate industry in general is uh, allowed to access that facility. And even if they were, they might not meet some of like the leverage requirements um, in order to be eligible for that sort of lending. I think the more important thing is that they've basically like removed all requirements for banks. If a bank modifies a loan, they no, no longer need to like report that. If a company undergoes like a troubled debt restructuring, that no longer needs to be reported. We have no idea what's going on in our economy in terms of like how these loans are being changed. And I think that can be good for commercial real estate lenders because all the interest that they owe right now, they're like pushing back and capitalizing it and adding it to the end of the loan. But that's going to come back and hit, hit us in a few years. But so what was the logic to allow non-reporting? <laughs> I think the government doesn't want transparency on this right now because it might set off like a crisis. So this is, is like President Trump saying we should not test too much for COVID so that we don't find out that there, is, there are COVID? Absolutely. Our banking sector may or may not have like a huge disease and we don't know. So Kate, 
What's going to happen to all of us with all this bankruptcy coming online? Uh, I think that's a little bit like asking me to be able to read a crystal ball. <laughs> I thought that uh, this is what eco we economists do all the time, no? Just because I do research in bankruptcy does not make me any better equipped to forecast the future state of the world than you, Luigi. But I think that uh, on the one hand, as we said at the beginning of the episode, people fear bankruptcy too much. We need some bankruptcy of small businesses to clear the system. We are betting a lot on the efficiency of this new procedure. If this new procedure is efficient, we can get a lot of firms through the system without killing, hopefully, many of the viable ones. And my sort of a take would be, why don't we extend some unemployment insurance assistance to shield workers from the pain of the process? Because if I'm a worker and my firm goes through bankruptcy, I'm not responsible for that unless I'm the, the, the manager that brought it to bankruptcy. I think that these are good recommendations. And look, I think what's important to keep in mind is that we haven't seen a huge wave of bankruptcies yet. There have been some notable high profile cases in the past few weeks of like large corporations going bankrupt, Hertz being one of them. But in terms of small businesses, we just haven't seen the big flood that we were expecting. And a lot of that is because we solved the problem from the other direction. We just tried to give them a lot of money and we tried to uh, create a lot of unemployment protection. And I think that that was the right solution. But as to whether this will continue, I mean, that's the big open question, right? Like the HEROES Act was supposed to issue another round of checks to people. It was supposed to like free up a lot more money for states and municipalities. And that hasn't been passed yet because it's been stuck in the Senate. And so is that going to be confirmed? If it isn't, that means that we might see a big round of bankruptcies. But I question actually the validity of extending not the unemployment insurance, which I think it should be extended, but all the other subsidies for much longer. In a sense, I think the situation is very different than it was in March. In March, we had the perception that this was a temporary issue and then pretty quickly we're going to go back to normal. Unfortunately, now we see that this is not the case and probably we're going to live with this for another year. And certain businesses uh, will change dramatically. The number of restaurants, services that people will demand is going to be reduced significantly for a long period of time. It's painful, but some restaurants, my Luigi's Pizza, needs to go. And so the sooner we realize that, the better. We don't want to leave the workers of Luigi's Pizzas without uh, a, a salary. That's why the unemployment insurance is important. But I don't see the benefit of sustaining Luigi's Pizza's forever when it has no future. And it says, at the end of the day, you don't want to throw bad money after good money. I think that you raise a good point. At the heart of all of this is this extreme uncertainty as to what the new normal is going to look like, right? Is it going to be that we end up going out to restaurants like 90% as often as we used to, or is it going to be 60% as often as we used to? And for a company that's barely hanging on, prior to the crisis, that can make a really big difference in terms of whether it's viable or not viable. I've been working with a group of bankruptcy professors to try and think about these issues for small businesses in particular, and you know, we're still puzzling over what's going on. To be honest, we'd like to see a little bit of like what's going to happen before we really make concrete recommendations about how to change the bankruptcy code. But the two things that we have been able to say have been, number one, we need more judges and trustees. Right? Because, like you said, there's approximately 350 judges in the whole country. That's not enough if we see a big wave of filings. Number two, we would like a little bit more time. So under the Act right now, it's really meant to be streamlined. The manager of a small business is supposed to have 90 days to file a plan. And it's just not clear to me how much of that uncertainty is going to be resolved within 90 days or even like, you know, 120 days. And so we've proposed that we just push back some of these deadlines by about six months so that companies can know a year from now whether they're viable or not. We don't want a bunch of reorganizations of firms thinking that they might be viable because we're over-optimistic only to have them, you know, end up 
liquidated down the road because they can't meet the terms of their plans. And we also don't want a bunch of liquidations if it turns out that the company uh, that the economy ends up rebounding in a year. But can't you differentiate a bit between different kinds of companies? Because with all due respect for pizza's places, but it's not that the organizational capital of Luigi's Pizzas is so great. In a sense, there is an oven, there is a client list. If uh, I were to shut down Luigi's Pizzas for six months and then we start, probably the client list is as good. I can rent another oven and uh, I don't think that the oven has depreciated very much. So the important point here is we want to save businesses that are worth more as going concerns than debt. Those businesses are businesses where there is a lot of organizational capital, there is a lot of unique dedicated capital that once we destroy the business, we can't reconstruct overnight. Many small businesses, in my view, don't fit that bill. I think this is what makes it so hard to think about a small business. Because from an economic standpoint, you know, just in terms of like comparing a small business to like Facebook as a startup, it seems like a pizza restaurant really isn't that valuable. But if you think about small businesses as a whole, right, every single one in the country, I think that there is a great deal of like positive externality there. Just it, it makes it nicer to live in a community that has a bunch of businesses open. And if you shut down a bunch of businesses, that can lead to problems. And so I... I don't think that when we talk about economic value of a small business, I don't think that we really take into account those like positive externalities. And that makes it really hard to think about when we talk about efficient reallocation. But I agree that in some cases you have positive externalities. First of all, this might be true for retail, physical, brick and mortar retail businesses. When you go to online businesses, it's less clear that's the case. But if that's the case, that can be very easily addressed by the municipality that can reduce taxes on those buildings. And it says, if I want to preserve a vibrant downtown uh, center, I reduce or even eliminate property taxes for businesses that have some characteristics. End of story. Uh, we don't need to use the bankruptcy system to achieve those goals. I totally agree. I don't think we should be using the bankruptcy system to achieve those goals. I think that the bankruptcy system should be like an absolute backstop. But one of the problems with what you proposed is that like states and municipalities are also really hurting right now. And it's not obvious that they're going to be able to afford to cut back uh, on those taxes because the alternative is that they're going to have to fire like 100,000 teachers. And so everyone's kind of in a bind right now. Yeah, I think we discussed in a, in a previous podcast, but there is definitely room for some fiscal transfer from the federal government to the local government to avoid a downward spiral in the local economy. I think that that's, uh, this clearly has some reason. And as we said, maybe this should be part of a bigger package in which uh, some states might be allowed to go bankrupt because of the past mistakes. But we need to divide, and this is, I think, the lesson of bankruptcy. We need to divide the past mistakes from the future viability. Your financial situation is a combination of the two. In fact, your financial situation reflects more your past mistakes than your future viability. And what uh, bankruptcy should help you do is separate the two. Bankruptcy itself is capitalism. I think we said at the beginning. Okay, yeah. Whether this particular reform is the best we could have, uh, only time will tell, but uh, let's face it, we are lucky to have this versus what we had uh, a year ago. I will tell because I'm writing a paper on the efficiency of the new system. <laughs> Capital Isn't is a podcast from the University of Chicago Stiegler Center in collaboration with the Chicago Booth Review. Also check out promarket.org, a publication of the Stiegler Center. Don't forget to subscribe and leave a review to Capital Isn't wherever you get your podcasts. Mm-hmm.